Actually, I hit record sure. the minute you came in, but I cut off the bits before they go up. Okay. <laughs> well, we want to welcome JB Riley. Um, she is an author and has short stories in Fire and Swashbuckling Cats of ours. Um, so welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I told you these things are often awkward. <laughs> It, it's it's challenging. We met very briefly a couple of years ago, I think it when worlds collide, yep. when words collide, pardon yes. me. And it, it is awkward because you know, we're both talking to unknown audiences. We met maybe once years ago. And so this is it is a little odd, but it doesn't have to be. This is a it's a it's a lovely snowy morning. We'll just have a discussion. A lovely snowy morning. Where are you? I'm in, I'm based in Chicago. Oh, okay. It's minus twenty six here, and <laughs> Celsius. So lovely. Yeah. <laughs> Relative. Yeah, it's it's one Fahrenheit here, okay. so we're 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 pretty close. Edmonton, you get a a, a little bit more of an extreme than we're we in do Calgary. in Chicago. So oh, we're Calgary. Not quite as bad as Edmonton. Edmonton's even colder. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. A, a, remember explaining to a friend of mine who lives in Christchurch, New Zealand, which even though they're at the absolute bottom of the world, mm -hmm. they, it, you know, you're on an island, you have yes. that semi-tropical climate and explaining to him the, the 135 degree Fahrenheit temperature swing that Chicago gets. And he, he was sure I was pulling his leg, but it, it really, the good thing about Four Seasons is like right now, I'm working on a story where cold is an important part of it. And I had not intended to be writing it in the winter when it's hitting the polar vortex. It just happens that way. And it's 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 a really good way to to get, you know, to 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 feel what I want to write when I'm out there at six in the morning getting the dogs to do what they're supposed to do outside. So well, because we live right next to the Rocky Mountains, we get Chinooks. So we can have 40 degrees swing, 40 degree swings Celsius in 24 hours. You can go from minus 20 to plus 20. <laughs> yeah, and a we, lot of we get those. <laughs> don't actually believe that either. It's like, how can you go from that cold to that warm? And it's not a regular occurrence, but it does happen. Yeah, the the joke with the Midwest is if you've turned if you've turned on the heat and the air conditioning on the same day. Yeah. Yeah. No, we we get that. Okay. I mean, regularly we get swings. They're not always that wide, though. But it's not un unusual to go from plus to negative values really <laughs> quickly here. So if you suffer from migraines, this is a bad place to be. Ooh, I believe it. <laughs> Guess what I suffer from? Uh <laughs> oh. Oops. Wait. Oh, hang on. We there. have a cat trying. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's trying to join in. He's making a cameo. Yeah, he is. Well, and part of the fun is they it wasn't intentional, but if you look, this is Teddy. He's the big cat, and he is very much resembles the uh, the guy on the cover uh, the cover of Swashbuckling Cats. Yes. And I I I I have been assured it was unintentional. So, <laughs> but he'd be he was happy to to serve as a model if necessary. We used to have a tortoise shell. We don't now. She passed a few years ago, but um, she hated everyone except us. And she was <laughs> a little bit like like that, except she didn't have any white on her. She was. Mm -hmm. These calicos have white tortoise shells. They're similar, but with no white. Yeah. Yeah. No, we have Teddy is about uh, twelve pounds. Uh, the puppy that I talked about earlier is about, he's, he's over 70. He was 68 and a half pounds a couple weeks ago at his last weigh-in. Uh, we have an Akita who's about 70 pounds. And then we have a little black and white tuxedo who is about six pounds. And she's the one in charge. She gives <laughs> the hell out of everybody else in the household. So she's, she's in charge. We currently have a black cat who's on a vet mandated diet and she hates oh. us right now. <laughs> yeah. She's I like, believe that. What do you mean? I can't have this business. <laughs> well, all our cats are rescue cats, and she's the first one. All our other cats, you'd put out food, and they would eat when they're hungry or not, and whatnot. She's mm -hmm. the first one you couldn't do that with. She would just 
eat everything in front of her. And for a while we were like, oh, our food dish is empty. Okay, we'll fill it. And then we noticed, okay, maybe we shouldn't fill her dish every time it's empty now. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Ted, Ted was, was taken in off the streets. We joke about how we took him in for a play date and he never left, but he'd weigh 50 pounds if we let him. Yeah. He's, you know, he's got that kind of. Yeah, Tegan's about 15 pounds now. <laughs> Wow. She was up to 17. She's lost a couple of pounds now. but It's a big cat. They want her closer to 11, so she's got to lose another four pounds. She's not happy. <laughs> sure. Anyways, I guess we should talk books. And so Absolutely. Let's that, talk books. Why don't we discuss your story in Swashbuckling Cats to begin with? Certainly. Um, yeah, Back that it was... Yeah, it was a lot of fun to write. The um, what I what I did, I'm I'm. This may not surprise you, having talked to me for ten minutes, but I am I am a bit of a of a of a scattered nerd in that <laughs> I like a lot of different. <laughs> I like a lot of different things. So my story was when when Rhonda announced the call. Mm -hmm. for swashbuckling cats nine lives on the seven seas how can you not love that how can you not want to put a story in for it i started thinking about okay well what what do i know about pirates mm -hmm. and things like that and what i know about pirates are mostly from pirate movies pirates but of penzance wrong. yeah exactly and that's all it is wrong but that's okay so so taking i am a massive fan of the musical cats Mm -hmm. And my favorite song from the musical Cats is Gus the Theater Cat, who, if you have either... I've seen, seen actually, musical, we have the, the DVD, came out in the 90s, of the, yeah. of the theater version, or not the theater, yeah. the theatrical version, yeah. much better than the recent movie, but yeah, we have yeah. that still. Yeah, I, I have I have yet to to find enough alcohol to be willing to watch the the, the recent movie. You know, it's but, okay. Okay, I go good. On that I mean, but I think I find it okay because my expectations were really lowered based on reviews, so it's better yes. than my expectations were. <laughs> okay, but I I would suggest go find that that um, if you can the DVD from the the theatrical version. Um, it's amazing. Yeah. Anyways, I'm so sorry, Gus. Just... No, no, that's fine. So Gus, Gus, his big thing is he he is he played Growl Tiger. That's the mm -hmm. pinnacle of his career. And Growl Tiger was a pirate cat, right? We know that. Yes. So I took that fact and I combined it with a twenty-plus year um, subscription to Vanity Fair magazine, which does a lot of in-depth actor interviews and things like that. And that became, I kind of tossed it into a blender and hit pulse. <laughs> and that became the concept for my short story about, uh, called Buccaneer's Revenge. And um, it, it, it takes place partly on a, a set, partly in a movie, partly as an interview for Vanity Fur. Because the other thing I did is I, I adore puns. The, wor the, the more atrocious, the better. So I stuffed as many puns as I could think of as possible into this story and, and wrote it from there. And I don't know if Rhonda loved it or she just was afraid I was going to submit something even more egregious if she rejected it. But, uh, but Rhonda Parrish, our wonderful editor, did take it and, and ended up using it. So I was very pleased. I remember setting up this story because you have the interview. I had to set all the text different on the interview part. Oh, yes. Yes. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, because I'm the one that once Rhonda and Margaret are done with them, they, they give the mm -hmm. manuscript to me and I turn them to make them look like a book. Oh, that's cool. So that's, that's a lot of fun. Yeah. So, so yeah, I remember that. Yours was the one that yeah. needed extra work. <laughs> Yeah, sorry about that extra work. Yeah, that that is indeed. <laughs> okay, and then we'll pop over to Fire, which is a really short story. Mm -hmm. Short story. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and fire actually went ever ever since I was a little kid and I learned how to read. I've wanted to write. Mm-hmm. But having things like having to keep myself alive and pay my bills, um I I didn't do a ton of writing. And so for a very long time didn't try to write, didn't do anything other than I do writing and editing of of large technical governmental proposals for for my what I call my day job, my real job. And so when you're when you're typing about, you know, information security protocols and protections for anywhere between 8 and 16 hours a day depending on the deadline, I had no room in my brain to do any kind of creative writing. So a couple of years ago, um I, I, for some reason, because I read voraciously, I'll, I'll read the back of the cereal box if there's nothing else in the morning to read, that kind of reading. I was reading something and I stumbled upon this call for, for a short story. And I hadn't written any kind of creative writing in many years, but I thought, you know what, this could be fun. And the great thing about the call was it was very, very specific mm-hmm. in that it laid out, this is what I want, this is the theme, this is what I want to see inside the the stories. If you can add these pieces of information in, you get essentially bonus points. So it was it was a very explicit submission guideline. Yes. And with technical writing, you hit the submission guidelines. You answer the questions, you add the points that your client or the government wants to see. You have to do that. And so the the good thing with the way this call came out is it was so specific. I was like, well, heck, I can do that. So I, I typed it up and I wrote it. And again, I submitted it and, and, you know, hula hula hallelujah. I had never submitted in 30 years any kind of short story and because i literally went down and had a checklist (laughs) this is what the editor wants check this is what the editor wants check she accepted it which started all of my reboot of creative writing and i've had so much fun with it over the last couple of years so when i went to when words collide in was that 2018 Mm -hmm. yes it was 20 i was doing the math it was 2018 it was my first writer's conference. It really? was. That's quite a yeah, really. to jump into. I, well, you know, I, I'd been to Calgary before. We loved the Rocky Mountains, had been up and down traveling in Western Canada. So it was, it was reasonably familiar. But you guys were all so wonderful. And it was so much fun that, that I was like, okay, I can do this. <laughs> so I've been trying ever since with limited success, but that's part of creative writing. That's part of it, yeah. There's, um, in 2018, I would have been working the Taiki table, but I'm one of the founding members of Words Collide, so. Oh, very nice. Yeah, yeah I went in 2018, 2019. I had my ticket for 2020. I was ready and, <laughs> you know. Well, did you attend any of the online stuff? I did not. I did not. If If I am there and I have the vacation, so to speak, I can focus with the pandemic because the company I work for is a, is a massive healthcare entity. Ah. If, if, if I'm not like sleeping or, or eating, I'm pretty much trying to work on the COVID planning. So right now, from what I understand, 2021 words Clyde is still up in the air because, well, let's face it. Nobody knows what's happening at the moment. Yeah. So. So it may or may not be online only because they have to know, even though the convention's not until August, they have to make a decision, obviously, months before that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I really hope so. But we we need to be healthy first. Yeah, so. that's the thing. Well, August, who knows? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And August is a lovely time to go way further up north toward the Rockies. Is my theory so well the one year it might have been the year you were there maybe it was the year before it, it was record-breaking heat that was the first year i was there yeah, yeah. it was ridiculously hot and it, it, even for me because again chicago gets heat we, mm-hmm. we go over 100 in a chunk of the summer anyway but it was not just only hot we there were all uh there was a really heavy um wildfires yep. at that point too that's pretty common in the summers here actually yeah 
Yeah, and that is that is one we we don't get hurricanes, we don't get wildfires, we don't get mudslides. We get everything else that the rest of the country gets. Well, so. we don't get hurricanes either. <laughs> I'm good with that. Yeah, we don't get mudslides. We do get the occasional flooding. Okay. Um, because because Calgary, I mean, I'm not actually in Calgary. I'm one of the uh, bedroom communities, but Calgary's mm -hmm. on the corner of two rivers that meet. So mm -hmm. you get the occasional flooding if you get in June when the rain rainy season is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know one year the zoo was completely flooded out. They had to close it because it's on an island. Ours oh, wow. Island. So, <laughs> so they had to close it because it was flooded out. That okay. Was the year Patricia Briggs was our guest that year because I was I was their oh. liaison guest liaison that year, and I was taking oh, them to big all the tourist spots and um, yeah and yeah they we we sort of did the zoo I think the penguin enclosure was open but that was about it so okay no I'm a I'm a huge Patricia Briggs fan yeah. big big fan I've got I've got her latest coming that's coming out next month I've got it on hold yeah. and and ready to go so. And in 2018, the guest of honor was um, Guy Gabriel K, yes. who I'm also a massive, massive fan of. Well, and he's a, it he's was been to Calgary, not not necessarily words collide, but I was big in the convention scene before then too. And he's mm -hmm. been to Calgary a number of times, but he's Canadian, so yeah, yeah, yeah. He was he he gave a fantastic talk. And in I was I had a chance to attend one of his panel discussions, mm -hmm. and he did a great job. Including, he picked up and he's walking around and with the with those dishes of candy that they that they had for all the panels. He's walking around and make sure you know giving everybody a little <laughs> piece of candy before it started, so that we would all have something to to chew on. So yeah, I don't he know if that was too party room on Friday night. So Taiki House very nice invitation only party room. Mm -hmm. I, I mentioned the party room often in these interviews, and I. Thought maybe I should mention it's invitation only. <laughs> that's, because, that's not a bad idea. Yeah, because Otherwise, there'll be people showing up. We buy some really really expensive scotch. <laughs> he is. I follow him on Twitter. I understand he is a massive scotch fan. Well, we invite all the words Clyde guests, and because I was a founding member, they they tend to get invited through. You know. And I'm personal friends with Randy. I've known Randy long before words Clyde, Cliff. Cliff, I've known 30 years now, I think. Oh my God. And uh, Randy, maybe closer to 20. <laughs> so, so yeah, so the guests usually show up at our, but yeah. But um, yeah, no, guy, most of the guests are nice. I don't think I've met mm -hmm. a guest that hasn't been nice. Good. So what else have you got out there? Um, well, I am a I am a chicken. I can't stand horror movies. I don't like any of those, but I am really enjoying. I've written and and sold a couple horror short stories. For some reason, if it comes out of my brain, it's not as nearly as scary to me. Um, I'm I'm very proud of the fact one of them was was picked up for one of uh, last year's best of. Oh, yeah. for Helios uh, Helios magazine and so that that like so many other online magazines they they collect and then take a best of every year and then they do print out a hard copy so I've got my little best of from Helios um, I've got a couple of other things that are floating around I'm trying really hard even now to have something out for consideration, even if it's just one story. So, like right now, I have one story out for consideration. Have you uh, submitted Lackey's magazine? If you're listening, <laughs> so. are you or have you submitted to our newest anthology coming out, the Home for the Holidays? I came up with the. I saw the call uh, that Margaret sent out. I came up with a great idea, and then I read the submission requirements and realized that the idea I had had nothing to do with what she was looking for. So that's kind of percolating around in the back of my brain right now. Um, no, I'm actually part. working on, yeah, no, I'm I'm working on something for uh, for Rhonda Parrish has a call out for her. This is the cyberpunk. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, she's got all of the the gas lamp and and all of those, and this is for the cyberpunk opportunity. As I'm working on something there, I've. 
I I am totally a a by the seat of the pants writer. Yeah. So I, I'm about 3,500 words in. I know how I want to end it. <laughs> I just have no idea how to get from 3,501 words to however many words the end will be. So that's what I'm working on right now is to figure out how to map my way there. Well, that one's not through Taiki, so I don't know if I should allow it to be spoken about. Ah, I didn't, I didn't say who it was through. Didn't, well, didn't Rhonda, mention it. You know, Rhonda's... <laughs> Uh, that's fine. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Rhonda does a but, lot yeah. of things outside of Taiki, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Taiki, you guys do a lot of things outside of Rhonda too. You know, I've I've enjoyed looking through. You guys have got a nice little website that I've that I've looked through to see cool. what's my, what else is out there. That's my creation. I did the website. That's a nice website. I do the website. <laughs> it really is. And you know, as as someone who is is very much deeply a new creative writer i do i do enjoy going to the publishing websites going through to the magazine websites and and kind of reading what are you looking for because again my brain for 25 yeah. years has been hit the submission requirements meet the requirement meet the deadline meet the requirements submit the technical pieces mm -hmm. so it's it's been a great learning tool for me to you know that's one of the things is hey Hey, if you could say one thing to, you know, somebody else who's brand new is meet the deadline and give them what they want. And the way to do that is to do the research. Yeah. What are the requirements for home for the holiday? Yeah. Uh, oh, Christmas. And then just like, yeah, just, <laughs> just like everybody else in the world, you know, I'm, I'm working on a novel. Everybody, including the cat, is working on a novel. <laughs> the hard part is finishing the novel, right? Yeah. And then thinking, okay, how do I then take that and expand the world? One of the things that, again, I'm a voracious reader. I'm reading the 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 most recent Jim Butcher right now, mm -hmm. the Harry Dresden series, and the 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 world and the building of it. Now, when when you go back and you kind of read the his very first books you can see his progression as a as an author as a writer but also how it's like going back and watching tv over again for a large series as you can see all the little foreshadowing that the yeah. writers put in and that is just awesome and again i write totally by the seat of my pants so any foreshadowing that i put in is completely <laughs> coincidental at least until i go back and i reread the first couple chapters i think oh wait yeah maybe somewhere in the back of my brain i was thinking about that so or in the rewrites, you can add foreshadowing. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true. See, I, I have to get to the rewrites, though. That's that true. means I have to finish the darn book. So, <laughs> yeah, Taiki has this. Maybe it's a good problem. I haven't decided. We technically haven't been open for submission for a few years mm -hmm. because our authors keep writing new things, the ones we have. That so is a really good we problem have to have. Seven books coming out this year, and wow. I guess the anthologies count as new as open for submissions. But the actual books mm -hmm. are, you know, like book seven of Eileen's book is coming out. There's a book of, you know, so it's like. And I love her books. That's that was another one. As I met her at when words mm -hmm. collide I, I i picked up the first copy you know her first what was it seeing the light yeah, seeing the i think was the very first and i i just i loved it i read it on the plane coming home absolutely loved it brought it home and and i want to read more i want to go further into that just like again just like the the patricia briggs books the harry dresden books all these others is it is good that you've got authors who are continuing to write these series because people might pick up book, you know, four or five or whatever, yeah. and then they want to back up. Yeah. So it's just like October, uh, Sh Shannon McGuire and her October Day series. I don't remember how many books there are, but but <laughs> but we're all caught up and the next one is coming out. And I picked it up. I think I grabbed it because I'll just I'll go to the library and I will just I can I could live in a library. <laughs> you know, if I if I if I brought my coffee in with me, I could live in a library and having the chance to pick up, even if it's kind of like book three, book four, whatever, 
like um, you know, EC Bell, Eileen's books, you could probably jump in midway. Probably. Yeah, I was I mean, lucky to get stories, the first one. There is an overarching, but most of them are stories unto themselves too. Mm -hmm. Histories yeah. are stories unto themselves, and then there's stuff sprinkled in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just walked up and, and asked her, "What's the first one?" She said, "This one." And I said, "Great," and grabbed it and made her sign it for me. So, but you yeah. can you can pick up any of those. So, Eileen's so full of energy whenever you meet her. It's just like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. She really she is, and she's she's you know again everybody is so nice. I I know that there are conventions. I know there are author groups who are not nice mm -hmm. or who are more insular. But I have, again, it may be because I'm fortunate or it may be because I enjoy making friends or it may be because they're kind to me because then I'll stop talking. But whatever the case might be, I really have enjoyed meeting Eileen, meeting you, meeting Margaret, meeting Rhonda, uh, you know, Laura, Van Aaron, Doc Baugh, all of the folks who are part of this writing community. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing, again, if somebody comes and says, well, you know, Jill, what should I do? It's the same idea is find a community yeah and and work within that community because when when you've gotten past the politeness point and they're kind enough to give you things like feedback <laughs> and say jill you know that that this, this part's great but this really sucks you kind of need that as a writer to to rather than think that everything is wonderful and it's like you know a finger painting from kindergarten oh mom will put it up on the on the fridge Mom's not going to buy the book unless it's worth buying, you That's know? Right. Yeah, I always tell even self-published people is to invest the money into a good editor just because even if you give it to your friends to beta read, friends are friends. They're, they're, not mm -hmm. going, to, they're going to be a little biased, even yeah. if they don't think they are being and even little things get missed. So I always suggest, yeah, because then an editor will say, that sucked. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, So I always suggest, absolutely. even if you self-publish, spend the, I don't know how much it is, but have an editor look at it just to, because you can hire external editors just to make sure that. Yeah, and, and a good copy editor, you know, a good proofreader slash copy editor too. Because like, if I'm writing something, I know what I intend. And again, back to my day job is, is I may look right past something that makes no sense or it, I copied and pasted it or it's just simply a misspelling that spell check doesn't pick up because it's a different word um, is, is a good proofreader is just about worth their weight in gold. You know, well, honestly. Occasionally we'll see things and, it, and it's really minor. Like this character will be called say Virginia through the whole book. And then just in one spot, not sure what the author's thinking, but once he called her Veronica. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, and, and, and you could read it because you're reading it 40 times. You'll miss it all 40 times. Mm -hmm. So, you know, fresh yeah. eyes. Someone Absolutely. Who does that. Okay. Now let's talk about, I don't know what we're going to talk about. <laughs> Told you. <laughs> awkward. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you said you're all, all things geeky. What is all things yes. geeky? Yes. Cuz you're talking to Yeah, okay, let's shall we see if we could out geek each other? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Nerd off. Let's do this. <laughs> all right. I have an entire shelf dedicated to Assassin's Creed statuettes cuz I've played every one of them, so I've got the first one from Altair to the current one. Okay. Now, anything that is video games that is modern tabletop, you're going to blow me out of the water. Oh, okay. I, I the last time I played... Almost 300 tabletop games sitting on bookshelves downstairs, too. So <laughs> Very nice. No, the last time I played a video game, it would have been Centipede in a bar in around 1987. Okay. Wow. Just to... Set and yes, I was in the bar legally just to set the you know, but um, well, no, that's that's I, I'm, something I'm older than I look. I know people always do that to me, and I'm like, <laughs> my oldest daughter is 34 years old, <laughs> so there you go. I'm older than I look, yeah. So, no, I 
Very good. And see, that's good because the older you get, the younger you look as the older you get, the more people are just going to be green with envy. That's fantastic. Yeah, I know people always comment, oh, I should go to a different view suit because um, I don't dye my hair. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and I'm lucky it's still mostly it's color. I'm like, yeah. I don't know how I did that, but hey. You know, good genes. So, no, you, you're going to absolutely blow me out of the water with anything like that. Um, most of my nerdy dumb is from, okay, number one, and, and you know, somewhere Rhonda is going to cheer. I'm a huge hockey fan. So, I used to watch hockey religiously and be in part of yeah. the pools and whatnot. Not as much lately. Now we're into um, soccer, British football, um, the BPL. Mm -hmm. And F1, my husband's big into Formula One. But yeah, I used to be a huge hockey person. Yeah. And, and I was, I grew up in Detroit. I was born and raised in Detroit. So I was a Red Wings fan. Oh, yeah. And then I moved after wandering around um, the country in a slightly misspent youth. I moved to Chicago about 26 years ago and became a Blackhawks fan, which, <laughs> you know, apparently somewhere I'm supposed to have an internal conflict and my head's supposed to explode. Right. But, <laughs> but in the house, we're very careful. We root for both the Red Wings and the Blackhawks. So when they were in the same, when they were in the same conference, yeah. we, we, again, you lay out, okay, you root for good plays, you root for goals, you root for good hits, things like that. So, but no, I'm, I'm the kind of, I, I have multiple jerseys and season tickets to the local minor league hockey team we level used to do of that hockey fan. We had, mm -hmm. uh, I think it was third row season tickets and my take the kids all the time. Very nice. And it, that's that's the fun part. Yeah, the Chicago Wolves are oh, they're the they've been they're 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 an independent AHL team. So they're the farm team for they've been the farm team for Vancouver, they've been the farm team for um for Nashville, they've been the farm team for they started out as the farm team for Atlanta when Atlanta had the team, then they became the farm team for Winnipeg when Atlanta moved to Winnipeg. So they've never been the farm team for the Chicago Blackhawks, though, even though the two arenas are you could you could ride a bike. You know, they're not very far apart. So they're that that's part of the fun is going and watching these guys who are, you know, when they're still puppies, when they're still the yeah. 18, 19, 20 year olds and then realizing, wait, I, yeah, Dustin Bufflin wasn't nearly that big when he <laughs> played for, you know, when he played with 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 that team and watching all of the leaders of tomorrow you know so that's always a lot of fun we found with the hitmen our our um, um teams after the games about a half dozen of them which you won't see in professional hockey would go into the in, into the the area where all the food is the food court area and sit mm -hmm. behind a table and sign autographs yeah yeah but um i remember at a flames game and my daughter would have been about 10 so we're talking a long time ago I told you her age mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we were at a flames game and we were three or four rows back I had gotten free tickets so we were really close mm -hmm. and oh I don't remember what player it was, it was so long ago anyways flames won by one point and the um the ref picked up the game winning puck pointed to my daughter to make sure nobody else grabbed it and gave it and <laughs> threw it to her so she got this puck and then coincidentally, I was working for a company and we were at a event and that hockey player was at the event. So I got him to sign a cap for her. So oh, she's nice. got the game winning puck from him and she's got a signed cap. And like now she's a hockey person. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's how you do it. No, that's it. It is. It is how you do it. Yeah. Many years ago, um, when I lived in Raleigh, North Carolina, Raleigh had the ice caps which was a, they weren't even ECHL. They were, they were a little tiny, um, they were a little tiny team. And this is back in the early nineties, um, early to mid nineties. And Gordy Howe was, was doing a tour for the, and it may have been the ECHL and the USCH. It was, it was one of the old farm team systems that has since dissolved very shortly after. But he was there doing a tour, and so he dropped the puck. 
And in, in Raleigh, North Carolina in 1990, call it 1992, 93, nobody had any idea who he was. So, and I, I certainly did. And I was like digging through my pocket, looking for something, anything that I could get him to autograph. We know who Gordy is now. And <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and Gordy famously would autograph. He was happy to meet his fans. He'd autograph, you know, anything. So I finally... I finally ran out, bought a program, an ice caps program. And then, cause he was standing down, um, he was standing down in one of the, one of the wells of the arena watching the game. And I, I went up and I was so apologetic. Cause I'm, I'm really nervous meeting, you know, believe, believe it or not, I, I can be shy. So <laughs> I, I went up and I had the program in my hand and I, I had just borrowed a pen from one of the concessionaires. And I said, I'm, I'm very sorry, Mr. Howe. I'm, I'm a huge fan. I remember as a kid watching you at the old Olympia. Do you mind, would you, would you sign this? And he's no problem. He, he, he picks, he has hands the size of babies. You don't <laughs> understand how big a man that he was until you're standing next to him. And I am not a small person. And he's like, of course. And, and he signed it and he said, you know, so, you know, tell me about yourself. And I told him I was from Detroit. When I was a kid, my dad would take me to see him, blah, blah, blah. And he looks at me and says, oh, I'm not that old. That was my father. And of course he's teasing. Yeah. You know, and I was like, I no, no, I know what Mark Howe looks like. And I know what Marty Howe looks like. You're, you're, <laughs> you're the right one. So, but yeah, that, that kind of thing, again, going back to people being kind when you show interest. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. So huge hockey fan. Um, back in the day, I was a huge, huge comics book fan. Um, I, I started my first Dungeons and Dragons book was the, the blue soft cover basic D&D because that was all they had. Because I started playing Dungeons and Dragons in around 1978. And I still have like Taiki and some of the other um some of the other, it's it's common to have dice as one of the giveaways when a new book comes yeah, out. Like Ron, Rhonda fire. especially likes to do dice. Yeah, absolutely. So so I guess that's a really big thing because as I'm following people on Twitter, they everybody's talking about their dice. I still have the little, they're solid plastic, and they were what there were six of them, right? The little tiny yellow four-sided dice and the little green eight-sided dice and the yeah those are those are my dice we that have, I use because it works too. my husband played long before I did but yeah he he has he has the original um the um tiny you know the small size D&D mm -hmm. books he has yeah them. um and then a few years ago, so I got it for an anniversary present. They did a re-release of, of those original ones as a special box set. So I got them. So he had wow. them side by he has he brought out his originals that he has and took them side by side and said, okay. <laughs> so um so yeah, we we actually still play. We just finished a campaign last weekend, the weekend before we finished a campaign. So yeah, we still play. So maybe I out geek you there too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, so far you're blowing me out of the water. Sorry. No, don't be. No, don't be at all. Absolutely. Actually, and that's, and that's... I can let me lift my camera. Oh no, okay. I've got a virtual background, so it won't matter. Yeah, you've got the. I've got um three bookshelves right here to my my left. They're mm -hmm. all D and D books. They're not just D and D. There's Traveler and there's GURPS and there's. But yeah, we've got three bookshelves full of just D and D stuff to my left here. <laughs> Very nice. But yeah. Okay, so I'll ask. So now I'll ask you: Are you a Marvel or a DC universe person? As far as the movies and stuff, Marvel does it better. Let's face it. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I'm not a comic book person hugely, so you probably out geek me there. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not it but when i do probably marvel uh, x-men are more my thing for the comics um I, john I think, my husband yeah. has a bunch of comic boxes from before from when he was younger and they're mo yeah. mostly marvel too i think comics 
but yeah, I'm not. Yeah, so you probably beat me there. I'm not a huge. I'm not a. I don't have anything against them. I just, you know, too. There's too only many so other much things. time. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, there's only so much time. Because like, and, you, yeah, I'm I, a voracious reader. I read. Um, well, Goodreads says so far I've read six or seven books, and it, we're only a week into January, February, so. <laughs> Yeah, I sat down one time a couple of years ago to try and figure out, you know, okay, how many, you, in, anybody who's a big reader has probably done this, how many books have I read? Yeah. And, and you start counting backwards. There was a wonderful little used bookstore um, a couple miles from, from my house where I grew up in Detroit that I could ride my bike to. And he had this huge, huge space in a, in a little warehouse. And so... And it was it was you know the old school um, three by five index cards. He would keep a card for everybody oh, yeah. who brought books. Yeah. And you could either he'd he'd buy the books from you, or you could hand them in for credit. And for every two books you brought in, you could get one different book, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, thinking, and then moving um, several different places across the country. And the, the downside to books is they're heavy. Yeah. You know, especially some of these big old honking. Yes. Yeah. You know, so I can't just go to my bookshelves and say, okay, well, let's see. I've got boo, 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 boo. No, I had to sit and calculate because I also, I'm, I'm the terror of the library. You know, when, when I was a kid and found out that there wasn't a limit to how many books could be checked out, I would go wild. Cause like at the school yeah. library, which realistically is probably the first library that, that, you yes. go to as a little kid as you go to the school library and then you go on a field trip to the to the big library for again we were it was uh, first grade was our first trip to the library and that was no big deal my mom who was also was a voracious reader had taken me there before but you go to the library with your school kids when you're six and they say okay you can take one book yeah and so, okay, I'll get my one book. But then when I was a little bit older, I realized, well, wait, I, if, if I go by myself, I can take as many books as I want. I would have just <laughs> as, as many books as I could carry, I would take them. And, and I had three weeks to read them, and I'd, I would be perfectly happy sitting in a dark corner and just reading. Well, can't be dark when <laughs> you'd like to read. <laughs> well, you know. Sunshine. Yeah. Yeah, sun, sunshine, sunshine is helpful. But also, um, where I lived in the city of Detroit, there was a there was a couple streetlights close enough that actually in the summertime, well, year round, but in in the summertime, if I couldn't sleep, the light from the streetlight was bright enough, shining into my bedroom window to be able to read by. Mm. So I would simply kind of angle a little bit. And it's like, okay, this is good. I, so I didn't have to ever read under the covers with the flashlight, you know, like kids do. No, I could just lean over a little bit and, and lean against the glass pane of the window and, and be perfectly fine reading my book from there. So, See, I was lucky in one sense in that my mother was okay with reading. So I never had to read under the covers of the flashlight as long as I'm quiet in bed. It could be like two minutes <laughs> of reading, fine. <laughs> That is nice. That is nice. Yeah, and and back to the back to the Marvel versus DC. I think that I think that you're absolutely right in that Marvel simply does. It, it, they have a lot more to work with. The downside to so many DC heroes is they're virtually they're 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 almost without flaws. You know, Superman. Well, is DC Superman? Does, um, yeah, Superman's not a superhero. We can get into that in a moment if you want. Um, DC <laughs> does TV okay, like Arrow we enjoyed and The Flash mm -hmm. we enjoyed. Um, yeah. So, so they do TV. They haven't quite. I mean, I suppose the Batman movies are, are an exception, but they haven't quite reached, got it quite with the big, the big, with the big screen yet. I mean, I know everyone will point to Wonder Woman, which we enjoyed. But it still wasn't, you know, to be honest, and and a lot, and, and I know this is controversial. We enjoyed Aquaman more than Wonder Woman. And I know that's I loved Aquaman. But, um, it's 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 not. I loved Aquaman. Okay. The best thing, and we we absolutely loved Wonder Woman. And and but to me, the best thing and the most surprising thing about Wonder Woman 
was not that it was a good movie. We all, of course, had hopes, but it is such an effective war movie. Yes. You know, is the 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 Battle of No Man's Land, that that entire scene, the series that led up to and then led from that is one of the best one of the best ways that that in my opinion that kind of thing has been felt and i am i am a little bit of a world war 1 buff my my you know i'm born and raised in detroit but most of my family is actually canadian mm-hmm. they're from um stratford near the kind of between the london and windsor area of ontario and so my grandfather fought in world war 1 he was gassed in in the trenches he spent, I think they said, three months in a hospital in France recovering. His brother, my my great uncle Donald, died in. I'm never going to pronounce this well because I never took French, but it's it's Ypres. Ypres. He died in the Battle of Montserrat and is buried there. So I've got a real heavy connection, and I've done a bunch of reading and a bunch of studying of that time and of that place. And like I said, it just that particular scene within Wonder Woman, which was a very good movie, that particular scene just I thought was fantastic, including the concept of PTSD and the concept of soldiers struggling to, you know, do the right thing. Yeah. So. Yeah, my husband's big into World War II. He's got a whole bookshelf dedicated to World War II stuff. So. Yeah, we went to Hawaii when I was a little kid, when I was eight, and we took a family vacation to Hawaii and toured Pearl Harbor. And that triggered a fascination with World War II, but almost everything in the Pacific theater. So I, I'm a little sketchy as to a lot of the points of the war in Europe for World War II, but the war in the Pacific, because I had a direct connection again, if, if something interests me, you know, I'm I'm the I'm the reading equivalent of a of a you know, of a jackdaw is if something is shiny, yeah. I'm going to go get it and I'm gonna dive into it. And I'm going to read as much as I can about it until something else shiny comes along. That's my husband. So, yeah. So I, I talk about how I am a font of useless knowledge, but by golly, do I love trivia games. So <laughs> yeah, he, my husband's more into Europe and Africa. He read a lot. Of, he, he, he did a lot on World War II in Africa because okay. that's not quite as well known yeah so so yeah he, he he's got a lot of knowledge of africa and europe but not as much as the pacific mm-hmm. well you need you guys need to go to hawaii <laughs> or pearl, pearl harbor get a chance to kind of soak in the atmosphere especially right now right and and then that will trigger <laughs> right. an interest. We'll hop on a plane tomorrow I don't think absolutely that'll <laughs> yeah it's it's what a seven hour flight give or take you'll be fine yeah plus the two weeks quarantine on either end yeah yeah but you know <laughs> 83 and sunny versus minus what is the conversion yeah the minus six and and oh, cloudy is. maybe worth all right i'm gonna look it up <laughs> <sighs> temperature smartphones are great okay yeah. so we have minus Clear it all. Minus 26. It's minus 14 Fahrenheit, almost minus 15, okay. 14.8. Okay. Yeah. So. yeah. A couple of years ago, you guys would have gotten the polar vortex too from a couple of years ago, right? Probably. Yeah. So I know in Chicago, it went down to something like minus 24 Fahrenheit without calculating in the wind chill. And we had been. My my wife and I had been on a cruise out of Miami. Mm-hmm. I flew back because I had to come back to work. And she stayed did another back-to-back cruise, right? So I walk into the polar vortex where it's minus 20-something <laughs> without the wind. And that's Fahrenheit. And she calls me from Miami Beach. <laughs> and says, hi, I hear it's cold out there. <laughs> so, and uh, the the the... the purely fortunate thing is the day after I got home, our furnace stopped, our furnace died. Mm. And if I had done the back to back, if I had decided to play hooky for another week and done the back to back, we would have come yeah. home and the entire house would have frozen shut. Yeah. You might have and, some pipes or something. 
we absolutely would have burst some pipes. And we're on we're on city water sitting here yeah. in the middle of Chicago, Illinois, and we have massive water pressure. I would have had a frozen inland lake that is my unfinished basement if those pipes had burst. So much as I was cursing the day and, you know, even even the Akita, which is like a Malamute, heavy, heavy northern breed, is sticking her nose outside in the middle of the polar vortex and saying, no, I'll, I'll hold it. I'll wait. Even though I didn't want to be there, I was so grateful that I was there. Yeah, we get, well, I mean, this is common. It's a little late. We had a, an amazingly mild winter so far, so I can't complain about this because it's, like um, yesterday it was minus 36 with the wind chill and, and they meet at minus mm -hmm. 40. So that'll tell you how cold yeah. it was. Um, yeah. But yeah, we'll get to the minus mid thirties for a little while. Yeah. Probably not this year. Like I said, it's been a real mild, mild winter. So yeah, I mean, I complain about the cold, but it's not uncommon and I don't go outside anyways. I don't have to <laughs> commute. So <laughs> and, I have no reason to complain. Yeah. Yeah, and, and honestly, that is one nice thing about, I mean, if, if, if there is a silver lining of the pandemic, it is that I, I'm not driving through running up to my office. I'm not going out into the super cold. I'm not shoveling the foot of snow off the driveway so that I can drive out. And even though I've got a four-wheel drive, there's only so much that a four-wheel drive you know, yeah. can do. So, no, as, as, as stir-crazy as a typical winter is, it's 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 not bad well my husband commutes to to the city like i said we're in a bedroom community so he commutes to calgary every day so i just laugh at him as i move to the to the to the bedroom we've converted to an office as my commute have a good day <laughs> oh that's tough like, yeah yeah and when when this started we we're i i have i have a team of um it flips a little bit right now i have eight folks on my team because again we're the writers and editors for all these technical proposals um and we are comparing who had the longest and who had the shortest commute and one of my writers who's down in who was down in southern illinois had because they have a big old house they got kids they got a big old house and so she had to go you know, we measured from the kitchen to your office because, you know, the kitchen is where the coffee pot is. Right. And she had the longest place to go because her office was up on their third floor. And I can if I leaned hard in my chair, I could probably grab my coffee pot. I can certainly touch my hand into my kitchen. Well, so my kitchen's downstairs. It's where yeah. it's down a floor. So it's not. But I mean, oh, my goodness, the world will end. Yeah, I know. Yeah. You keep seeing the occasional ears. She's. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, he likes to hold hands. That's what he's trying to do wow. is in the morning when I've when I've got everything and I'm 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 working. He wants to he wants to hold hands. He just puts a paw out and expects us to hold hands for a while, which, of course, means I'm working on my computer one handed. So mine. Well, she's 15, so she she sleeps a lot, but oh, she she's still annoying like cats can be sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's it is. And that's we don't know quite how old he is or or our other cat. They're probably I did the math the other day because it's like I still think of our little cat Gwen the tuxedo as a kitten because mm. she's in part because she's so much smaller than anything else in the house. <laughs> and she's like eight. Yeah. You know, so it, it is it a time goes faster as you get older and B these with cats, especially you don't see them slowing down until they start slowing down. You know? Yeah. And I mean, and all our cats were rescued, but then she was rescued eight or nine ish. Obviously, you can't have an exact mm -hmm. date when they're. But our, our previous cat, the tortoise shell I mentioned, she was 19 before she passed. So. Wow. That's, that's a good age for a cat. Yeah. Yeah, because we got her, she was still a rescue, but she was a kitten, so we could better estimate her age. Yeah. Yeah. And we got we got Gwen the little one when she was about three months old. So we we do know exactly how old she is. This guy right here, it's it's a guess, but he's probably about the same age. Yeah. We actually the um he, he's because he is big and he's got you know the 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 snowshoe paws, he's got massive feet, and so um he showed up at the vets in the back of a cop car oh. the 
Yeah, a, a neighbor had had called the cops and said there's some sort of wild bobcat something <laughs> that is that is knocking on my back door looking for food. And so the cops came because why not, right? And they they picked him up. They put him in the back of the squad car and they they just drove him to the nearest veterinarians because they didn't know what else to do with him. And so Teddy ended up at the vets. We were in for something, probably you know shots for the dog, whatever. And and they and they basically said, "Hey, do you do you need another cat?" It's like, well, no, I don't need another cat. Well, do you want another cat? No, don't want another cat. Will you take another cat? So we said we'll try him out for a weekend because we knew nothing Bad about idea. him. Bad yeah, idea. I know. Yeah, no, I, I, I walk in. Apparently, I had sucker across my forehead, right? And so I said, well, okay, we'll, we'll try him for a weekend. We'll, we'll bring him home for a play date. Mm-hmm. And if he gets along with the household, then, then we'll, we'll give him a good home. And, and he walked in. He looked around. He sat down. He licked himself and fell asleep. It's like, okay, he's, he's here. He's ours. Well, when we went to the shelter, we deliberately picked out Tegan because she was black and we know black cats aren't as mm-hmm. quickly adopted. Yeah. yeah. And there was actually two or three black cats there, but Tegan was the first one we saw. So we, and, then, and, and we said, okay, we'll take her. And I said, but before we said, we'll take her, I, I said to my husband, well, did you want to look at one of the other cats that were there? And he goes, no, because we'll end up taking home two or three cats. <laughs> See, that's a smart man right there. Yeah. So, um, right, well, Rhea, we're almost out of time. I've, know, I've had a blast. I love talking to people. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it. But I wanted to. Is there anything else that you need to cover? Can I give a shout out to, to, to Taiki your and your wonderful? I need my to cover pluggables. Your pluggables are. I don't have pluggables. You don't have um, a public Facebook page or a public website. I do. I do. I, do. Okay. I have. There is. There's a little. There's a little um, semi-neglected website. Uh, JBRiley.com. Okay. Um, my my gmail if if you're nope, looking don't for us, don't give an email okay no never mind no email spams and stuff oh, i get i i am i am so used to getting spams from all my other stuff but but yes, I, know. I do have we a little generally website don't publish emails i mean presumably they can get through you through your website or they can contact absolutely you through us if people want to mm-hmm. um, yeah absolutely i generally try to avoid putting emails directly on here that is perfectly fair. That's absolutely fair. Um, like I said, I am I I am really learning how to. Well, no, I am because creative writing is completely different than technical writing, which is completely different than than writing for a newspaper, which is originally what I was going to do way back many decades ago, and all these other things. So the reason I don't have a ton of pluggables right now is because I am still learning how to be a creative writer. Mm. and how to figure out do you ever um, not do you ever stop learning that i i think the correct answer here is no i do not (laughs) i don't care who you are you i don't think you stop learning well and and realistically you don't it's like playing an instrument across the street from where i grew up was the he was either first or second chair as a kid i don't know cellist for the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, which is a fantastic orchestra. Mm-hmm. And I'd be walking home in the summer when his windows were open and just hear the most amazing music <laughs> because this, this world-class cellist mm-hmm. who, who made his living with it still practiced. He'd still, he would practice for four hours a day. Wow. And he would practice. It's the same way as a kid learning the cellist practices, which is he would start out doing scales and doing his warm-up exercises and then playing a couple of the things that he, he had played so long and knew so, so well that he could play it without thinking about it to kind of warm up. And then he would start to practice whatever the, uh, whatever the symphony was going to be working on, whatever their, their, their you know, upcoming season was going to be. So, so no, I am always going to be learning how to be a creative writer, just like I am always going to be learning how to, you know, how to deal with cats and, and how to, how to play the guitar and all of these other things that I had to be a better person because it all kind of fits together. So no, I'm, I'm, but, but seriously, I, I've got half a dozen published short stories, well, 
that other people have published short stories to my name. But I hope that the next time we talk, I will have something pluggable. Oh, sure. OK, well, we want to thank you for attending the interview. Absolutely. This is fun. <laughs> and we will talk to you later. OK. And don't necessarily hang up. That's where I quit it. OK. I'll put, I'll put all your links in 